Welcome, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome, everybody, to the Progressive Governance Digital Summit and this evening's lead panel on the fate of the world economy, how progressives can shape the great transformation. Thank you, everybody, for joining us here digitally from wherever you may be in your office, home office, porch, or at the lakeside, maybe. And thank you in particular to our distinguished panelists who are joining us tonight. Um, we will discuss among us um, for about 40 minutes, and, but of course you can pose your questions and it's best you submit them through the event uh, platform and they will display it here to my screen and then I can read them out later on to the panelists and of course if you want to address somebody in particular, please do so. Let's see who's here with me in this digital room. Uh, we have uh, Annelise Dodds. She's a member of the British Parliament serving for the District of Oxford East. Welcome, Annelise. Um, Nadia Calvino joining from Madrid, as I've heard. She's the third Deputy Prime Minister of Spain and Minister of Economy and Business. She's also an economist and academic and uh, a longtime civil servant. And her country's candidate for the Eurogroup presidency, uh, possibly succeeding uh, Portugal's Mario Centeno, which is to be decided early in July, I believe. So we're um, really uh, excited to be able to discuss with you tonight. And then last but not least, we have Danny Rodrick, who is the Ford Foundation Professor of International Political Economy at Harvard John F. Kennedy School of Government. Where are you joining from, Danny? I, I, from Boston. From, ah, from Boston. All right. So this is a really international call. Uh, you may be missing uh, the German Minister of Labor and Social Affairs, Hubertus Heil, who was to join us here on the panel too. But as it is, uh, it's the second to last uh, week of discussions at the Bundestag. And uh, they have lots of packages to pass legislation, of course, some of it Corona related. And he's to speak on the floor tonight. And uh, since the schedule has been, um, uh, has been delayed, he won't be able to join us. But he has asked me to send his warmest regards both um, to the three other panelists and, of course, to all of you who are watching out there. And uh, he will be in touch in one way or the other, he has promised, because he actually looked very much forward to this uh, discussion. And and um, he says it, uh, he, he's re it's really a pity that he can't be there tonight, but of course, being on the floor of the Bundestag is a thing too. Um, let's maybe start with the biggest question or the big question or hypothesis underlying this panel, the great transformation. Will there be a great transformation or will we all go back to normal maybe? Um, let's maybe start with you, Deputy Prime Minister. Do you expect things to change radically in the world economy? Thanks uh, very much. Very well, thank you very much for the invitation to participate in this very interesting discussion. I, I take this opportunity also to congratulate Danny Roderick on his recent uh, award in Spain uh, for the 2020 Princess of Asturias Award in Social Sciences. So it's a, it's a pleasure to meet you, even though it is over a, a screen, and to participate in this event uh, together. Now, I, I think that one, I mean, let me start by saying, uh, are things going to change? We're obviously, we're in the midst of the crisis, so it's a bit difficult to foresee what's going to happen afterwards. But I would say that what we can expect is that there will be an acceleration of processes that were already taking place. For example, concern about climate change, for example, digitalization. For example, also the increased awareness about the need to have a more inclusive and sustainable growth going forward. We have seen that in, in recent years that all international institutions are becoming increasingly aware that it's not just a matter of growing, but also ensuring that no one is left behind from this growth. And then there are a couple of other uh, developments that I think will have a, a strong influence. That's the increased awareness by citizens of the role of the state when uh, the crisis hit then everybody turned to the state to look for protection, to look for uh, good health services, more security, uh, which I think will lead to an increased awareness of the important role that the public sector has to play in, in our societies. And then secondly, also an increased sense of insecurity about the provision of some basic services and goods, supplies that we thought were 
we could take for granted, um, but in, in decades uh, they have been produced through international supply chains, which were not so resilient when the crisis hit. So I think this is also an angle that will certainly have an impact on, on our policies and on the world developments going forward. So it's still a bit early to, to know exactly what will change, but certainly a number of um, drivers will be reinforced. Uh, some uh, developments will be accelerated uh, and others maybe are going to come much more to the forefront into the concerns of citizens uh, throughout the whole world. Thank you very much. We will certainly go deeper uh, into some of the points that you have mentioned, but I'd like to hear Annalise Dodd first on the big question, will there be a great transformation? Well, first of all, thank you ever so much for inviting me to be part of this panel with the other two panelists who you know, I admire greatly. And I really wish that we could be together in person, of course. The last event that I attended in Berlin, uh, organized by um, Progressive Governance, was fantastic. I could only wish that we were back to those days already when progressives can meet each other in, in person and have these debates in, in person. Um, I, I very much agreed with what Nadia said, I suppose, um, particularly viewing this from the perspective of a country which is is really struggling to get on top of the, the health challenges from coronavirus and many of the economic challenges as well. Um, I do think this period has indicated to us the need for state capacity. Um, the fact that, you know, in times of crisis, it's necessary to have resilient public services um, it's also revealed many of the weaknesses in a completely liberalised approach to labour market policy as well, where um, obviously in, in a country like the UK, we have very high numbers of people in precarious work uh, who had very little savings before this crisis began. Um, but will it necessarily lead to a progressive turn? Um, I think that's a harder question and that's where we all must ourselves play a part in building that narrative for change. And I'd say that in relation to two areas. I mean, first of all, um, clearly we will see quite a, a, a significant increase in unemployment, including in countries like the UK, where we were quite cushioned after the global financial crisis. You know, we saw a long drag on living standards, but not a big increase in unemployment. Um, there could be some arguing that we should just promote kind of any jobs, not decent jobs, actually to have productivity uh, rising in the long run, we need to have decent jobs um, as well as just employment growth. But that could be a tension, that could be a challenge. There are, of course, others saying that now is the time to focus on deregulating rather than on ensuring that kind of environmental transition that is so necessary. Um, so I think really whether this change is a positive one um, and these reflections come out in the direction we want, you know, that's that's a burden that must fall on all of our shoulders as progressives. It's something we will have to fight for. Thank you. And Danny Roderick, what do you think? Is this a time of change? Uh, thank you. Uh, thanks first for organizing the panel and, and having me greetings to um, uh, to my co-panelists and and thank you very much, uh, Minister Calvino, for for your kind words. Um, I, I agree very much both with what um, uh, Nadia said and what Annalise said. Um, this is an opportunity. Crises are always uh, a time of opportunity, and I think this pandemic has been a kind of um, magnifying glass, um, uh, uh, making it very clear um, how unsustainable our existing um, economic and social arrangements were um, in terms of um, the, uh, the deep uh, divisions, um, spatial income wise in terms of uh, access to uh, social um, um, uh, benefits and, and, and so forth that um, and, and that does create um, a, an opportunity. But I think um, we need a combination of things. We need uh, big ideas uh, to re reorient economic policy. I think we need uh, political mobilization uh, to push for uh, a new orientation. Um, and, and we need uh, a, a kind of an overarching um, appealing narrative uh, that's going to capture the hearts and minds uh, of, the, of the electorate. Um, 
I think we shouldn't forget that the, the last big crisis, um, this one looks like it's going to be a bigger one, but uh, the 2008, um, 2009 uh, global financial crisis was a pretty big one, uh, the biggest since the Great Depression. And by and large, uh, it was um, the uh, the nativist right, the authoritarian right, um, uh, uh, political groups that were able to uh, to capitalize on that by essentially um, wrapping a, a kind of an ethno-nationalist narrative uh, around uh, what were deep down socioeconomic anxieties um, and, and, and the disappearance of what Annalise called uh, decent uh, jo job opportunities. And that's a major problem that all our societies face, a sort of disappearing middle in terms of um, uh, the middle class, the middle class squeeze, the disappearance of, of good, decent jobs and labor markets, and which in, in turn shows up in our polarizing politics, disappearing as well. Um, so I think uh, you know the experience of, of the last um, 10, 12 years is, is a kind of a, a warning that uh, uh, while this could be a time for change, it's not necessarily the progressives that are going to. Uh, uh, capitalize on it unless we have the ideas, the political mobilization and the overarching narrative, I think. What could this overarching narrative be? Well, you're asking the, the, the academic when you have two politicians on the panel, but my own uh, view on this is, is that it's really all about um, good jobs or decent jobs, if you will. Um, that's, I think, the one fundamental economic social problem uh, that is um, behind many of um, the failings of um, our economics in the last uh, couple of decades. Uh, it's what I think uh, behind the rise of the authoritarian right when there's a um, large number of academic studies now that show that it's when good jobs disappear in local communities. Um, uh, um, it, it's it's very ripe ground for um, a political support for um, nativist um, uh, ethno-nationalist uh, movements um, that find easy targets in terms of uh, Muslims, immigrants, outsiders in the United States, the Mexicans, the Chinese, um, and um, uh, that's a kind of an easy uh, but very misleading narrative. And I think the the, the the progressives and the left will have to find an alternative narrative that emphasizes, that goes much more to the source of the problem, which is the disappearance of uh, good employment uh, possibilities. And, and that's, I think, fund that is, is going to require a different set of economic policies. We can't go back to the old welfare state understanding of, of simply investing in education and hoping people will find jobs because jobs are disappearing or simply engaging in a lot of fiscal redistribution through taxing more, although there's certainly some countries where we should be taxing more the wealthy and large businesses. But I think it'll have to come much more engaging in the productive sector in, in working with local businesses and small and large and, and reminding them they have a responsibility to uh, just as they need to internalize the environmental externalities on climate change that they generate, uh, need to internalize the uh, um, the good jobs externalities, which is that when there aren't enough good jobs, those societies, um, uh, communities suffer. And ultimately, it's business that pays a price as well. Mm -hmm. Nadia Kavinia, do you agree that this is about jobs and how could we create good jobs in times of economic downturn? Yes, uh, well, thank you. I, I find it uh, extremely interesting and and uh, exciting. Not not but not exciting, but you know, it. I find it intriguing what what I, I've been hearing, and I would like to add a couple of other points. Well, first of all, I fully agree with with Danny that the, and and Annalisa that the the quality of jobs is absolutely key. And Spain is one of the countries that suffered most in the last uh, financial crisis due to the large size of the building sector uh, and, and the weaknesses in the financial sector. Now, unfortunately, Spain also has a very high uh, part of the share of, the, of GDP, which comes from tourism, which is also one of the sectors most directly hit by this crisis. And therefore, we, we hadn't quite exited or got out of the last one when we are confronted with the uh, current uh, crisis. And the uh, internal devaluation that took place in our country led to significant decreases of real wages, 
and uh, low quality jobs uh, whilst keeping a very high percentage of workers with temporary jobs and so high instability and many people f fell out of the system in the last 10 years. Now, this time around, we have made it a top priority to avoid this happening again. So from day one, what we did was establishing short-term work schemes, such as the ones that exist in other countries, in Germany, in, in Denmark, in France, etc., in order to provide for a safety net for companies and for workers to go through this crisis. We also uh, injected a huge volume of, of liquidity into the economy. We have mobilized so far more than 65 billion euros in liquidity for companies so that the uh, solvent companies would not have to get out of the market due to this uh, transitory uh, shock as well as many other measures to try to protect the most vulnerable with moratoria in taxes, also renting support and, and all sorts of, of protection, particularly for self-employed workers. Now, so far, these measures are proving to be extremely effective because we, uh, conversely to previous crises in, in the Spanish history, we have seen that unemployment has increased but has not skyrocketed and actually employment has dropped less than the GDP growth. So, so far, we're able to protect take these jobs and they are being employed at a very good healthy rhythm the moment the lockdown has finished. So uh, what we see is that these kind of instruments are helping us in, in the short run. But uh, this does not uh, address the problem of the quality of jobs going forward. I'll come to this uh, back in a, in a moment. A second line I would add is that uh, redistribution is a key issue in, in a country like Spain where we have seen due to the last crisis poverty levels to go up and in particular even child poverty to come back to being a problem in a in a rich country which uh, we consider not to be acceptable so we have uh, put in place in the last couple of weeks and it's starting to be implemented a minimum income system extremely effective uh, uh, targeted to really those families in need and in particular single parent families uh, families with children in order to make sure that the most vulnerable do not suffer in the current circumstances. Those are the ones that are at the higher risk in, in this kind of crisis and most directly hit. And what I wanted to flag is that in, at least in our country, there is a very broad agreement on this. Actually, we passed this law in Congress and only the extreme right-wing party Vox, which has just became, become more important in, in the national parliament, they are the only ones that did not support this measure, which means that, at least in my country, there is a very wide uh, perception that we need to avoid the poorest to be left out and uh, these inequalities to continue to grow. And my third and final point, which I think is, is one of the key attributes of the progressive approach, and here I would add this to, to Danny Roderick's uh, point, is that we are looking to the future. We're future oriented and we're thinking about the best for our children and grandchildren. Well, I think this crisis is putting on the table a key issue of intergenerational fairness because all these measures we are having to implement mean a very significant increase of public expenditure and public debt which is a burden for future generations. And this requires that we borrow to invest in their future. And that is why at the beginning I said, I think that the green agenda and climate change this time around cannot be left to be a non-priority. This is a top priority because since we are uh, borrowing, we need to invest to make sure that our children and grandchildren inherit a better world. You know, We cannot let this opportunity go through without adopting measures and policies which are future oriented, which ensure that growth going forward is robust and strong, but also more sustainable from the environmental point of view, more sustainable from the social point of view. I mean, a more inclusive growth. And that, that agenda, I think, should be the winning one, uh, not only because of of course, this is the agenda of the Spanish government, but also because uh, from the perspective of intergenerational fairness, I don't think that any alternative agenda uh, would actually be uh, appropriate, you know, vis-a-vis -vis the future generations. Let's stick with the question of jobs uh, for another minute, Annalise Dodd, because um, there is a dilemma uh, when it comes to a green agenda and keeping the jobs. Um, I believe that in your constituency too, the car industry plays a major role. Um, of course, you 
probably want to keep those jobs. At the same time, those industries, um, many progressives feel need to be pressured to reform. Um, how can this play out in the crisis? What would be a good progressive agenda? I mean, I think the key to this question is having a strategic government which will take difficult decisions. And, you know, ultimately, this is an area where there are trade offs, where there will be change. I suppose that the sharpest end of that question that we're seeing currently in the UK is the aviation sector. Now, we can either have a planned approach to that change where there's a focus on redeployment, on reskilling, on helping those who may be facing unemployment otherwise, a focus on supporting those places that will be particularly affected. We can either have that kind of strategic approach or we can have a laissez-faire, hands-off approach whereby different airlines are left to fight it out amongst themselves uh, different regional airports are left to sink or swim and fight against each other. And we have a completely unplanned, chaotic uh, uh, diminution in the aviation sector. Now, pretty obviously, as progressives, I think we need to be arguing very strongly for the former. You know, there will be change in these sectors, but it needs to be planned change and one which protects jobs and helps to promote the jobs of the future. Um, I suppose just on the other points that the other speakers have raised very, very briefly, um, I think this crisis is enabling us to look at work more broadly. And certainly in the UK, there's a big discussion around the fact that, you know, those who used to be viewed as last, you know, the social carers, um, retail workers and others, those who were paid the worst wages, had the worst terms and conditions, now they are first in terms of our protection as a society against the dislocation brought from this disease. So I think we are having more of a discussion around these issues. Um, but as we do so, I hope we focus you know, both on the, the kind of traditionally industrial side, but also on the kind of everyday economy, I suppose, of people who work in social care, who work in retail, in tourism, as Nadia mentioned, others who need to have those productivity enhancing interventions who need to be helped to, to grow in their job, to have career progression, um, to be able to take on additional responsibilities, to be able to learn in the workplace, when certainly in the UK that support hasn't been there over recent years. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but um, in particularly for Labour parties, um, finding a way in this dilemma is, is very difficult. In Germany, for example, the Social Democratic Party has uh, pressed not to include um, bias premiums uh, into the economic aid package that has been passed uh, uh, by the Bundestag. Um, and it has been scolded by the unions um, for not doing so. Danny Roderick, how can labor parties serve their classic constituencies and be progressive at the same time uh, in a, on a green agenda? Well, I mean, uh, labor parties have the, uh, or parties of the left in general have the disadvantage that um, uh, their traditional base, of course, um, the organized, unionized uh, workers in, 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 you know, doing production work in manufacturing has become um, uh, so much of a thinner base. So that's not going to be the political base going to the future. I think the future is going to be sort of, you know, the broader um, uh, world of work, including, as uh, Annelies said, sort of the everyday work or the gig economy and, and in its all, all its varieties. And I don't think the you know, old style trade unionism is probably not very, um, very appropriate for uh, the variety of, of, of work that, that we see currently. So we need to imagine uh, different types of um, uh, uh, labor institutions. Uh, of course, I think, you know, strengthening labor unions is is part of it, certainly um, in the United States. Um, and um, um, uh, but also thinking about alternatives such as uh, sectoral wage bargains or sectoral work uh, uh, bargains that uh, uh, deal with work conditions um, in, in, in non standard work and things like, you know, so de de delivery or, or short time work uh, in different sectors. 
Um, and of course, you know, um, sort of labor market protections um, uh, 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 legislated um, nationally always as, 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 as a backstop to that. But I think um, the, the only way to, to, um, to introduce the labor agenda uh, um, in, in, into the green uh, agenda is really to, to combine them uh, uh, and to, to think about um, a, a, a grander bargain. I think in, in the, the European Green Deal uh, sounds like the sort of the American uh, proponents, what the American proponents of the Green New Deal uh, are, um, are, are proposing, uh, but seems to be different in, in one respect, which is that, as I see it, the European Green Deal focuses uh, much more directly and almost exclusively on questions about um, uh, uh, innovation and, and greening up the economy and, and, and leaves employment questions completely by the wayside, at least from sort of the superficial descriptions that I've seen. I don't think that's uh, that's I don't think that makes sense economically. I don't think it's going to fly politically. Um, I think sort of in, in decarbonizing our economies and 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 introducing new green technologies, the question about um, how to increase jobs uh, in in local communities as part of this new infrastructure, as part of you know sort of refurbishing buildings and and in making new investments in greening our economy how those directly impact on jobs has to be center uh, of this um, you know has to be at the center of this uh, green deal um, so i think what i'd like to see um in you know, of course you know the in, in the european green deal and of course you know britain is not part of it anymore but um the uh, in, in in the british approach is, is taking this sort of not Treating it as if it, there was a an inherent trade-off uh, that 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 uh, uh, addressing climate change is going to be harmful uh, to jobs. I think um, there is a way of thinking about the problem, which is that we need significant ramp-ups of investment and uh, build-up of infrastructure, um, and we can do it in a way that's also going to actually um, increase jobs or increase the quality of jobs if we put. Um, the good jobs agenda, decent jobs agenda, uh, on a par uh, with the uh, with the climate change, the green um, agenda, which I think it it it, it deserves to be. Do you expect, Nadia Calvino, um, do you expect economies to re-nationalize? And is this something we should hope for and that progressive politicians should um, foster? Well, thank you. I, I couldn't hear you before. So, um, well, I would like to, to react maybe to, uh, to the points that have been made by Annalisa and, and Danny before, because it very much resonates with our challenges in, in my country. I mean, Spain is the second car manufacturer in Europe, the second car exporter in Europe. And therefore, this challenge is very real. And uh, this very week on Monday, we did put forward our proposal uh, for uh, the support package for the car manufacturing industry. And we were confronted exactly with this issue, you know, how to ensure that we give the right signals so that the sector builds greener cars and moves and invests in this transition. And at the same time, we do support the jobs of today and the cars which are being made, cars and trucks and, and buses which are made uh, today. And so our package, I think, is quite balanced in that it puts uh, important investments, public investments, but also private investments will be redirected towards the production of greener cars. We also support the deployment of the infrastructure which is needed. Also, the uh, redesign of the cities which are at the heart, I think, of this uh, transformation. And there is also a support for the uh, replacement of, of cars, old cars, by new uh, cleaner cars. 
in that sense, uh, I think the, the, this, this uh, package has been welcomed, has been considered to be very, uh, very timely. And I think the main reason for this is that we have been working, there is ownership, we work together with the unions, and with the car manufacturers, and they participated in the event in the in the in the presentation on Monday, and they all considered to be this to be a very strong basis uh, going forward. There is also an engagement and commitment of investments and transform, transformation of the car manufacturers, and. I think this has come just because of the uh, clear awareness by all parties involved that the future is green and we need to uh, be at the forefront. We cannot be selling the cars that nobody is going to want in 10 or 20 years. From this point of view, the fact that the EU has regulated quite high standards is a clear uh, motivation and a driver of this transformation. Uh, everybody knows that in by 2030 uh, cars currently produced will no longer or we have to to move in a direction which is going to uh, increase the the efficiency the energy efficiency of cars going forward there is a transition where obviously we we need to continue to produce those cars until uh, that situation and I think that that is driving very much uh, industry in that sector. There are other sectors which are confronted with just the same challenges and which are maybe more complicated. But that one, I thought, you know, just just to share with you uh, this uh, experience. Then on the second issue, and, and I will be very brief because I know at least Danny Roderick has published a lot of uh, papers and said a lot of things on this issue. So I'm sure he will uh, be, uh, you know, have very good ideas on this one. I think again that we are seeing uh, um, an acceleration of a trend that was there before. Uh, we have for years been seeing a number of countries which are retrenching, they're going back inside, they're looking inwards, uh, and they are uh, questioning uh, the globalization that has taken place in, in, in the last decades. And I think this virus is just accelerating that trend due partly to the insecurity I referred to in my initial intervention, the fact that citizens have woken up to the fact that we are relying on each other for quite essential medical supplies, for example. But when a crisis hits, we cannot rely on each other. We, we need to be self-sufficient. At the European level, creating this kind of, of safety nets and, and provisions are surely going to be a key going forward. So it should come as no surprise that there is a questioning. Still, I think that uh, we need to work together and that the multilateral system, which has served us very well since the end of Second World War, needs to be modernized and needs to be updated, but is still the best, the, the best way forward, the only instrument we can have for moving ahead in a consistent manner to face the challenges which, frankly, go much beyond the national borders. Danny, uh, uh, Danny Roderick, I'd like to pass it on to you then. Do you believe that trends towards renationalization will speed up and do you believe that will be a good thing? I, I think some of it is, is a kind of um, a natural rebalancing. I think after the 1990s, uh, we pursued a very um, un unbalanced um, uh, globalization where um, I think the world economy and international competitiveness became a kind of a, a, an end in itself and societies had to, had to adjust to the world economy uh, rather than the other way around, which is um, sort of the, the traditional conception that came out of the end of the Second World War um, was that the world economy was a means through which uh, nation states, individual countries would pursue their own economic and social goals, uh, but the world economy was a means uh, in achieving full employment, uh, equitable outcomes, and a broadly based economic growth in countries. And after the 1990s, uh, your political leaders started to tell uh, you know, their, their people that they had to do this or that uh, in order to adjust to the world economy. It didn't matter whether it was the right or the left, uh, but it was still sort of, it was the, the national economy in the service of the global economy. And as a result, many of the inequities and, uh, and, and economic insecurities that being part of a very large world economy um, ended up sort of, you know, not being addressed sufficiently. Um, and I think what happened is that, um, you know, individuals, you know, who don't feel uh, secure are, are much less likely 
uh, to um, be open to the rest of the world, to, to, uh, to welcome change, to be open to outsiders. And I think so when we, when we fail domestically uh, in creating inclusive societies, we also undermine uh, the possibilities um, of having a, an open international economy. I think the secret of the success of the first three, four decades after the Second World War was that precisely in creating our welfare state, our inclusive societies, uh, um, equitable growth, uh, we therefore stimulated um, a, a, a thriving world economy that was based on uh, domestic economic uh, success, domestic economic social um, uh, coherence. And we lost that balance in the 1990s, and therefore we lost the domestic underpinnings of, a, of, a, of, of an open world economy. Um, so I think some of, uh, you know, some of the retrenchment, if you will, from hyperglobalization is natural. And to that extent, it's not necessarily harmful to globalization per se, because I think a sound globalization can only be based on uh, domestic inclusive societies when people are feeling economically secure domestically. Um, and so if you can create um, uh, the basis for that domestically through more inclusive economic policies, uh, I think a more global, uh, global uh, an open uh, world economy would follow. But I agree with what, um, what Nadia Calvino said, that there are a lot of aspects of the multilateral trade regime that needs to be adjusted. The current multilateral system is completely unable to accommodate uh, a, a country like China, which is a very different economic system. So I think we'll, we need to rethink uh, the rules of multilateral trade. Um, and um, and I think the U Europe uh, has, a, has a very big role to play in that. On, on that issue too, and um, maybe how could states or should states work towards um, renationalization or stopping hyperglobalization? Well, I think this is a, a really fascinating question. I was very interested in, in what the other speakers said. I mean, I think there, there's undoubtedly amongst many progressive movements currently and social democratic movements, a lot of discussion around increased self-sufficiency. Um, and I think to the extent that that would enable, you know, the more circular economy that we need to see for environmental reasons, I think that is a very sensible thing to be aiming towards. Um, I, I suppose it maybe a, a kind of couple of words of, of caution really, however, around this debate. So um, in the UK context, there's quite a lot of discussion around onshoring. Now, of course, in the UK context, this is happening at the same time as Brexit is occurring. Um, and there are some who have almost slightly flippantly said, well, we can just onshore manufacturing processes now, I would like to see, um, and you know, many economists, I'm sure, um, in the UK and industrialists would like to see um, a more integrated supply chain within the UK, you know, for a variety of reasons. But actually, creating barriers to trade very quickly at a time when many companies are are really struggling. Uh, would be most likely just to lead to uh, additional stress on companies and to even more of them going bust than has already occurred in the UK. So um, I think we need to maybe parse out the different elements of, uh, of this question. Um, I would say also, uh, to an extent, sometimes this debate has been linked to domestic capacity to produce the necessary materials for dealing with the medical crisis that's currently um, upon us. And again, in the UK context, um, a lot of the failure has been around coordination rather than a lack of manufacturing capacity. So, you know, we have many smaller firms that were really desperate to be involved in the effort to produce protective equipment, for example, but there weren't the mechanisms for coordination there. That goes back to these points about state capacity that we were talking about before. Um, so I, I suppose we need to kind of separate out the different elements here. I would say also we probably need to separate um, globalization. I mean, you know, Danny is clearly a, a massive expert on this, so I don't want to reveal my ignorance, but but separate out liberalization, marketization, um, you know, and lack of regulation from just additional trade flows per se. 
um, you know, if those flows are, are properly regulated, um, then we're going in the right direction. Very pleased to see Danny um, uh, giving me the thumbs up and also very pleased to see he has the Oxford pub crawl poster behind him, which is encouraging uh, also, but <laughs> thanks. Thank you. Uh, before Creating we move jobs on- for your constituency, Annelie. Before we move on to the audience's questions, and there have been some submitted already, um, I'd like to take advantage of the fact that we maybe have the future president of the Europe Group present here. Uh, and uh, I'd like to hear your thoughts um, on the dilemma of national versus international loans and um, the euro bonds debate that uh, sprang back up in this crisis. How should the EU proceed to, to yeah. a really big question? <laughs> very much but uh, let me start by saying that no decision has been taken on whether uh, i would run as a candidate yet so actually you know we have until the 25th to take the decision so uh, i would like to speak you know with this very important disclaimer uh, from the beginning but um uh, one one reflection uh, is that i think i think that one one general reflection and then one on on the eurozone and and euro bonds and, and this discussion the first one is that I think that uh, those that think that on the national basis, well, in particular uh, countries such as the UK or Spain, I mean, the US is obviously much larger, but when one thinks about one individual country thinking that we can, uh, we're stronger alone, I think this crisis has very clearly shown that going forward, we need to work closer together. And in this area, I mean, a very clear example in my view is the development of a vaccine. What we're seeing now is that we need all the intelligence and the scientific capacity of the whole world to try to have a vaccine as soon as possible. So guess what, you know, when people are inward looking, suddenly we're all actually looking around the whole world to see who has the fastest, the best vaccine and how we're going to be fighting the pandemic together. I think that what we have seen uh, with this pandemic is that we are on the same boat and we need to find solutions together. That's why I'm a, such a strong believer in the multilateral uh, system. Now, you can imagine that moving down to the EU and, and to the Eurozone, I also think that this becomes even, even stronger in this case. Our economies are very tightly knit, very closely related. Supply chains and productive systems are absolutely interwoven. We depend on each other for something as basic as food. Uh, Danny, I think, or Annalisa were referring to some of the workers that were considered to be not so important have become essential. To us, you know, one of the discoveries is that thank goodness that we have a strong food industry and that people were able to continue to live their normal lives in these very abnormal times. So I think and, and we, we see that uh, exchanges between the European countries are absolutely key if we want our economies to continue to, to thrive and to be stronger in the future. So from this point of view, uh, we're on the same boat. We have a European challenge and we need a European response. And that's why from the Spanish uh, perspective, we have very strongly pushed for a European response. I think that we are in a, in a relatively good spot here. The European Commission has put forward a very good proposal, which will be negotiated in the coming weeks. We have been able in the Eurogroup to put on the table important uh, instruments to provide liquidity, short-term liquidity for, for countries. Uh, we have reacted much faster than in the last uh, crisis and much more efficiently. And so at least on this front, I think we have learned the lessons of the financial crisis and we understand that we, we need to come out of this one together. It has hit everybody, every citizen, although different countries are hit in a different manner. But all countries, I think, are absolutely aligned uh, with the need to ensure that we uh, are stronger, as I was saying, going forward by being closer together and not, not by thinking that, um, you know, going down uh, in terms of the European integration is going to make us more able to confront the next crisis, which I hope will come very far into the future, you know, uh, when, we have, uh, when we have forgotten about the current one. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. This is um, a very good um, pass to the first question that has been posed and that has been put to my screen here. Uh, and it's a question on European solidarity. You have answered it from your perspective, but I would like to pose it to Danny Roderick too. And the question is, is there enough European solidarity to carry us through this crisis? Uh, 
I, you, you want the um, you want me to answer that? Yes. <laughs> well, I, well, I mean, I think certainly the the response uh, is, uh, is is much better than during the um, the euro crisis, um, where I think unfortunately much damage was done to um, a Europe, Europe, the you know the foundations of a European solidarity, and I think um, unfortunately looked at from the outside. Um, uh, the uh, you know Europe has uh, still um, some ways to travel to to make up for for lost time. I think after the 1980s, uh, Europe invested uh, a lot in uh, building a single Europe economically, uh, but uh, didn't do nearly enough uh, to build a single Europe from uh, a solidarity standpoint, from a social, fiscal, political standpoint. And I think. The problem of the eurozone right now is is the, the imbalance between the economic on the one hand and the uh, the social, fiscal, and political uh, on the other. Um, and I, I'm encouraged by the recovery fund um, because I think it is um, an important departure uh, on which um, I, I, I hope that uh, uh, that this will be a starting point uh, for. Um, the building of a of a common fiscal um, uh, infrastructure for for Europe, which I think is, if Europe wants to maintain uh, economic union, uh, it will have to also have a fiscal union or move into that direction as well. You that uh, uh, on the other hand, uh, the crisis could make differences between the European states. Um, or aggravate those differences. The European Commission has criticized uh, how lopsided the subsidies are. Germany pushing its own economy uh, with all its economic might, while other countries uh, such as Greece or uh, even Spain cannot do so in, in the same to the same extent. Maybe to you, uh, Nadia Cavino. Well, I'm a bit sorry that we don't have the German minister in the panel because I'm sure that he <laughs> he would have been the best um, to to deal with this. Uh, but indeed, I have been flagging actually from the beginning of the crisis the big risk of uh, breaking the the level playing field between the companies inside the, in, the internal market. And I think it is very important to ensure that we come out, we do not come out of this crisis with even more inequalities inside Europe. I mean, absolutely, as Danny was saying, we need to avoid that countries exit this crisis overburdened in terms of the debt to GDP ratio or with more social inequalities inside the countries and uh, with more inequality in terms of the chances and the competitive advantages of some companies in, in some countries as compared to others. I know the European Commission is very concerned about this. They have issued several guidelines on, on state aid and I hope we can as soon as possible go back to, to the previous situation, but it is also clear that we're in exceptional times. All countries are having to do uh, exceptional things, you know, to support their their industrial, their their uh, social tissue. We're all acting to the limits of what we can do. And since the challenge goes beyond what we can do uh, on a national basis, that's why we think that it's important to have a European response, uh, which would provide a safety net to companies, to states, and to citizens. And, uh, and, you know, so far, I can only say the progress we have made in, in just a uh, few weeks, because we all have the feeling we've been going through this crisis for, for years, but it's been three months. And uh, if this is a tunnel, I really think that the exit cannot be the same point where we entered the tunnel. We need to come out stronger uh, with, a, with a clearer agenda going forward, and I hope also uh, a stronger Europe. And Lisa, how do you see how things are going on the continent? And do you watch it rather uh, already as an outsider? Um, or do you still feel um, you're part of it? Well, uh, unfortunately, it, it is the perspective of an outsider now for, for Brits who look at these developments. Um, obviously, the UK government has said that it is determined to uh, create a deal with the EU. Um, clearly, we're concerned that we haven't seen the, the kind of application from the UK side that we would have wished to see. Um, there's already been an acknowledgement from the UK government that, you know, if, if there isn't 
the kind of deal that would be necessary that we would not be able to have um, you know, proper checks on the UK side of the border. Um, we don't have the requisite uh, customs officer officers in position for that eventuality. Um, you know, this is something that would be very damaging indeed for the UK. And of course, it would be coming on top of all the strains that have been meted on businesses because of the current crisis. So, um, yes, yeah, certainly many issues for us to deal with in the UK. I think it would be a brave or rather foolhardy UK politician who at this stage would be starting to uh, try and tell social democrats in the EU how they should be deciding these matters, however. So um, uh, certainly from my point of view, it's one of um, offering solidarity and, and friendship at this difficult time, but certainly not engaging in, in any of those debates. And then I have uh, one more question, which is quite specific and maybe goes to um, Nadia Gavinho again. Um, the question is from the audience and uh, the person asks, why does the European and Spanish car industry not invest in H2 hydrogen mobility? Well, well, actually, I think that we, well, the German government, although the, the German minister is not there, but I think the German government has made it a, a, a top priority, actually, to develop uh, and to, to research and to develop uh, in, into this area of hydrogen. And likewise, in Spain, in the package that we adopted on Monday, actually, we have reserved uh, uh, some money into R&D in all different technologies, including hydrogen. So. I don't think that we are fixated on a specific technology. We are quite neutral in that regard, but we need to make sure that those technologies are bringing us to, to are allowing us to reach our targets, uh, which have been set for 2030, for 2050. This is, this is ambitious, but as I was saying a, a moment ago, I am quite satisfied when I see the engagement of the Spanish car industry, uh, which uh, has reacted very clearly supporting this agenda, acknowledging that we need to remain competitive and that means that we need to build the cars of the future. And, uh, and so the, the public support is absolutely essential, but I think the private engagement is also key if we want to reach those uh, objectives and to ensure that the transition is, as Danny was saying, and, and also Annelise, we need to ensure that this is a fair transition. When we're talking about industry, we're talking about car manufacturing, but also when we're talking about the energy sector, uh, from the perspective of our government, we have made it also a top priority to ensure that this is a fair transition and that we take care of those workers so that we support also retraining, upskilling, uh, reskilling, and we accompany the process in order to make sure, as I said, I think uh, previously, that no one is left behind in these challenging times. And then there's another question. Um, maybe you decide who wants to pick up on it on the stock markets. Uh, we as progressives, the person asks, often do not address the problems that the stock markets with their profits and stockholders first rules present. Um, so how, what can be done to regulate the stock markets? Annalise Dutt, do you want to, want to take this one? Yeah, maybe maybe if I, if I kick off, I'm, I'm sure the other two panelists will have um, more interesting things to say. Um, I suppose, first of all, I would say that I, I think it's important to look right across the spectrum of forms of investment, because um, actually in, in a UK context, um, those stocks which are traded now are, are not reflective of investment overall, and there's actually more regulation of um, investment going through the stock exchange um, than there is of other forms of investment, um, and arguably there needs to be much more focus on those other forms um, as well as on what occurs within the stock market. I mean, I think more, more generally, um, and also across uh, business, but particularly amongst the investment um, community, people that I've talked to, you know, there's a shared agenda with many of the trade unions, um, social democrats and progressives broadly that we need to be seeing a new social contract into the future. We need to be seeing businesses which are more responsible, which are more committed to environmental targets. Um, the UK context 
the the um, stock exchange has been, you know, trying itself to develop some of the metrics that would enable people to be able to see progress in those areas. Um, you know, arguably, I would say that there's, there's far too many of those kinds of measures. You know, it's not clear um, uh, what different companies are are doing on that. But also, we don't have any clear measures around some of those critical issues of good work, decent work as well that are very, very important. So, you know, this is an area where much more work needs to be done, but let's look across across the, the plethora of different forms of investment. You know, I don't think it's just a, a question for the for, uh, yeah, stocks that are traded. It's a question for other forms of investment too. And then uh, the last question we can take uh, until uh, before our time is up is on uh, carbon border taxes. Is this uh, a good solution to punish free riders and a good incentive for the global economy to uh, transform into a more sustainable economy. Nadia Kamini, maybe I'll. Danny, Danny. Yes. Well, I, mean, uh, I think. The, I think the, the, sorry, go, go ahead. ahead. No, no, go ahead, Danny, please. All right, Danny, go first, and then we hear well, Nadia. I think, I, think, I, think, I think the the economic logic for uh, carbon uh, border taxes is is very very strong, um, um, but I think it it requires first a willingness to to do what's required domestically, and then you support it um, through um, whatever is required at the border. I mean, I think this is there's a general lesson here uh, about. Um, uh, um, international trade and international capital policies, which is that that uh, you know raising a shield is 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 rarely a good thing on its own right. So you have to always ask the question: Is there something worth shielding? Is there something worth protecting? So if if, if you're if you're pursuing domestic employment, uh, environmental, social policies. Uh, that are um, serving the um, uh, a, a more sustainable, more inclusive society. And I think it's perfectly acceptable to undertake policies at the border uh, that that prevent those policies from being undermined. And I think um, the carbon border taxes would be an example of that. If you have um, uh, good uh, environmental policies at home and you're, you're raising the price of carbon at home. Mm -hmm. Nadia Kavini, do you want to chip in? No, I, I fully agree. I think that we, we're confronted with a global challenge. If there is one global ch challenge, it's climate change. It is clear that no single country, no single region can actually change things on, on their own. And therefore, we need we need a, a, to, to also create incentives for all countries around the world to be increasing their standards on, on that front. Now, Europe has, I think, is leading this kind of, of debate uh, and establish, establishing very high standards, as Danny was saying, environmental, social and, and other standards, labor uh, standards. And therefore, we need to make sure that we also create uh, incentives for other countries to come up to, to, to that standard. But also we need to avoid that companies in the EU are at a disadvantage because otherwise they're not going to be supporting this, this progressive agenda. They will feel, well, actually, this is putting us at a disadvantage. We're less competitive. We don't follow you. We are not on your side. So as, as I said before, I think ownership of the whole society is key to drive this agenda forward. And that's why we have encouraged the European Commission to put forward a proposal for a CO2 border tax, WTO compliant, but we need to work on, 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 on instruments which are enable us to, to pursue this agenda for, forward because otherwise uh, there is a risk that there will be a backlash uh, if we establish very high standards in one part of the world which are then not followed by, by the rest of the partners um, whether or not they sign international agreements. You know, some have dropped out of the international agreements and, and that is even you know, going in the wrong direction in, in that regard. So. We have uh, encouraged the Commission to do so. There is a commitment to do so, I think, by the end of the year. And I think this is good news in terms of bringing forward a, a, a coherent national, European and international agenda on this front. Well, thank you very much to all three panelists for taking the time to be here tonight and uh, for discussing these questions with us. Um, our time is up, unfortunately. Um, I will have to clear the studio for the next session. And thank you very much, everybody out there, for uh, listening, for submitting questions, really good questions. Uh, have a good evening and uh, maybe stay tuned for the next lead panel, which is coming up soon. Good night.